take long walks, look at the scenery, doze off at noon, and then pretty soon you'll be flying again. Cottage core isn't just an aesthetic, it's an ethos, one embodying wholesome isolation, creative crafting, love of nature, and nostalgia for an idealized version of the past. Think thatch roof cottages, herb and flower gardens, reading poetry. But it's also a paradox. It's anti-modern, yet it exists and thrives in modern spaces. It champions solitary retreat, yet through public sharing on social media, online communities, and even video games. I am actually going to be touring my completed cottagecore forest core island. Maybe though, that contradictoriness is one of cottagecore's greatest strengths. Rather than making unrealistic demands that we all throw away our modern devices, the trend subtly encourages a reassessment of modern values. Like past movements where people flock to the country in droves to slow down from an increasingly fast-paced life, Cottagecore speaks to a growing rejection of hustle culture and the performative workaholism that peaked in the 2010s. Work like hell. I mean, you just have to put in, you know, 80 hour, 80 to 100 hour weeks every week. Here's our take on how Cottagecore just might be a bridge from the past to a more sustainable future. In the dismantling of all of our systems of life that we've known in the pandemic. Either to cling to it and try to make it work, or to just say, well, I guess I'm just gonna chart a new path. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. If you're a fan of this channel, then you probably consider yourself a lifelong learner. That's why I recommend you check out the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an incredible online learning community that offers thousands of inspiring classes. The first 1,000 take viewers to use the link in our description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. So check it out now and start exploring your creativity. It all seems so familiar, yet I know I've never been here before. I feel so at home. Cottagecore began in the late 2010s as a trend on Tumblr and TikTok, an aesthetic defined by rural countryside living and a love of activities like crafting, gardening, and baking. Let's make angel food cake. This vibe seemed to be the antidote to our fast-paced, technological, globalized world. And 2020 provided the perfect conditions for Cottagecore to explode into the mainstream. The COVID-19 pandemic abruptly took that fast-paced life away from many. I'm going to be baking bread, so hopefully Cottagecore can help me figure out how to do that. Isolation became the norm. While Taylor Swift's surprise 2020 albums Folklore and Evermore appeared to provide the perfect soundtrack. When you are young, they assume you know Adding to its appeal for people tired of a specifically urban or suburban grind, Cottagecore is a rural aesthetic. It's blackberry season at the cottage, so I made a blackberry mousse. Speaking to Architectural Digest, Davina Ogilvie defines it as a nod to the traditional English countryside style, romantic and nostalgic. While HuffPost's Amber Pardia sums it up as gardening, greenery, floral prints, flowy dresses, and animals. You want to feel like you would fit in on a farm. It's based on the timeless belief that the natural world is spiritually nourishing. Today I went foraging for clover and dandelions, and I met a turtle. This is far from the first time people have sought solace in nature as a tonic for the anxieties of modern life. During the 1800s, writers like Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson espoused the philosophy of transcendentalism. Transcend means the idea of the spirit transcending matter. In the hands of Emerson, transcendentalism focuses on the individual and the great uh, potential for every individual. Transcendentalism was also, according to historian Stephen Saunders, a resistance movement against the Industrial Revolution, which introduced a life of complexity, endless monotonous toil, the ugliness of factories, and the defilement of nature by urbanization. Thoreau famously spent two years living in a small log cabin by Walden Pond, eating wild food and meditating while writing Walden. I went to the woods because I wanted to live deliberately. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. Transcendentalism was about experiencing God through nature. I need solitude, Thoreau wrote. I have come forth to this hill at sunset to see the forms of the mountains in the horizon, to behold and commune with something grander than man. But you're wrong if you think that the joy of life comes principally from human relationships. God's placed it all around us, it's in everything. Emerson's famous 1841 essay, Self-Reliance, meditated on the virtues of listening to your inner self and not worrying about what others think. Quote, Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Essentially, Emerson tells us, look inward and you'll find everything you need.
In the 20th century, aspects of the transcendentalist philosophy reemerged. Romantic accounts of moving to the country became influential in the 30s on. And in the Back to the Land movement, which peaked in the 1960s and 70s, up to a million Americans left cities behind in search of a more sustainable country life. If we have lived in this country away from the major urban centers, we've seen the process the gradual destruction of the natural systems around us. While it overlapped with the greater counterculture movement, Back to the Land was more specifically a desire to get back in touch with nature. It was a reaction to suburban or urban lifestyles that felt increasingly disconnected from the fundamentals. And it may also have stemmed from negative anxieties about the state of the world, from disillusionment brought on by the Vietnam War and Watergate, to budding awareness of the devastating environmental destruction being wrought by humankind. All these young kids then, who had sort of been radicalized and were sort of anti-free market, anti-capitalism, kept on marching. Except instead of holding up Chairman Mao's little red book, they were holding up Rachel Carson's little green book. It's telling that some of the most popular television series reflecting the Times' Back to the Land ethos, like The Waltons and Little House on the Prairie, are influences on cottagecore, especially in the related trend of prairie core. The peace and beauty of the land and sky around Walton's Mountain was a source of constant comfort to all of us during those difficult depression years. It's a beauty. What kind of knife do you use to carve her? No knives. Chisels. In the 2010s, many of the same conditions that drove these past movements can be seen kicking into overdrive, between growing understanding that climate change is becoming an existential crisis, we can't go on consuming, wasting, over-consuming, and rise and grind obsessive work culture driving burnout. The World Health Organization recently added burnout to its classification of diseases as, quote, an occupational phenomenon. The stage was set for the forced collective isolation of the COVID-19 pandemic to accelerate the rise of cottagecore. As the coronavirus pandemic unfolds, it feels like everyone is baking bread. As the world grows bigger and scarier, it makes sense that we're witnessing a resurgence of this nostalgic pursuit of a back-to-basics escape. We choose the, the nature, so to live here, we are trying to solve problem ourselves. And on a deeper level, like predecessors, Cottagecore challenges the assumed narrative that all forward progress is good, especially as we're faced with mounting evidence of how much damage capitalism and globalization are doing both to the planet and to our personal well-being. The isolation that Cottagecore celebrates has a built-in creative element. The BBC's Anita Raukashi reports that a Singapore-based artificial intelligence company, Quilt.ai, analyzed more than 300 Instagram posts with the hashtag Cottagecore and concluded that the top emotion was creativity at 28%. I'm going to try making dandelion petal cookies, so I spent a while separating the stems from the petals. It was my first time using something foraged and baking, but it came out well. One name that's become synonymous with Cottagecore over the past year is Taylor Swift, whose folklore and evermore were products of the isolation of quarantine. I'm just writing songs in quarantine, and then they're it just became an album really quickly. And came complete with an aesthetic of flowing dresses, homespun cardigans, and bucolic tranquility. Swift wrote a folklore, In isolation, my imagination has run wild, and this album is the result, a collection of songs and stories that flowed like a stream of consciousness. Opening the album with the words, I'm doing good, I'm on some new shit, and saying yes instead of no. I'm just saying yes, I'm just putting out an album in the worst time you could put one out. More than a decade earlier, Bon Iver championed this creativity in isolation with debut album For Emma Forever Ago, which singer-songwriter Justin Vernon largely recorded isolated in a cabin in the woods. He has a hunting lodge in, in northwestern Wisconsin, and I went up there to just sort of be. I really had no intention of making a record, but in the, in the end, that's what happened. So it's fitting that Bon Iver features both in one of Folklore's most prominent singles, Exile, about the perspective that comes from reflective distance I think I've seen this film before. and the title track of Evermore. When I was if we can't all be Taylor Swift or Justin Vernon, we can experience the creative benefits of isolation. Moreover, we even need relaxation in order to function productively in any field of work. We can even see this truth in stories like 1989's Studio Ghibli gem Kiki's Delivery Service, where a young witch suffering from burnout discovers a healthier form of work ethic through a period of rest. Why don't you come and stay at my cabin? Huh? It'll probably make you feel better. The growing popularity of digital detoxes and unplugging through off-the-grid vacations or even Airbnb cuddle a goat experiences shows just how many people are currently looking to reassess their relationship with the modern world. It's one of the only moments 
where you don't have any screens whatsoever. You have space to daydream. But this brings us to why the escape from the world element of Cottagecore has been ridiculed as shallow. Are you really getting off the grid if you're uploading evidence of your spiritual fulfillment to social media? The common accusation is that Cottagecore is merely a silly performance seeking congratulation on a faux alternative lifestyle. The series Dickinson likewise takes aim at Cottagecore granddaddy Henry David Thoreau by joking that he was his time's equivalent of a phony hipster. The people may be there, but I have no use for them. Right, except for when your mom does your laundry. While it's clearly exaggerated for laughs, the pond is full of people. But they're everywhere. You say that in your book. It's true that Thoreau wasn't quite the hermit in the woods he's remembered as. As W. Barksdale Maynard writes, Thoreau's intention was not to inhabit a wilderness, but to find wildness in a suburban setting less than 30 minutes walk from Concord Village in a landscape heavily used for human purposes. I'm his sister. I live, I live just down there. Your home is far away, and you must return there now. What's most interesting about Cottagecore is that it doesn't fight this contradiction. Cottagecore doesn't advocate ditching our Wi-Fi routers. Instead, it embraces technology as a tool to allow like-minded people to connect over their shared values and offer each other new ideas. The great thing about online aesthetics and kind of the growth of this, which we've seen so much, you know, this last year, is that you're able to see yourself in them and you're able to get inspiration and connect with like-minded people. This is supported by the fact that Cottagecore took off during the pandemic, when the only communities we could access were online. As millions scramble for connection amidst quarantines, more and more users of all ages are hopping aboard. So of course when I look up Google images of the Cottagecore aesthetic, it's mostly white people participating in the aesthetic. So that's where I come in. Another common criticism of Cottagecore has been that it's an exclusive space, built from cultural references that are white and heteronormative. Heritage movies and period dramas in which marginalized communities are absent. Mr. Bingley, how do you like my ribbons for your ball? <laughs> Very beautiful. Its influences are mostly stories focused on the lives of wealthy white people, who are never asked to interrogate their privilege. You have to pull the weeds up to give the flowers room. The Back to the Landers of the 60s and 70s were also dismissed as a bunch of entitled rich kids. And as Dickinson's send-up of Thoreau gets at, it's long been a luxury to be able to escape modern pressures and go back to nature. Our dad owns a pencil factory. Yes, you are brave to make such a long journey into the wilderness. But perhaps surprisingly, Cottagecore is appealing to members of marginalized communities who are looking to engage with the aesthetic in a way that helps empower them. I have had so many Black, Indigenous, people of color reach out to me and thank me because they're finally seeing themselves reflected in the aesthetics that they want to participate in. Many members of the LGBTQ plus community, especially lesbian women, have found a home in the cozy world of Cottagecore, reclaiming rural spaces which may have previously felt threatening. It allows them to imagine a space without homophobia, fear, and judgment that doesn't feel like a banishment, but instead a specifically curated paradise. Speaking to ID, one queer cottage corer named Reed says, Unfortunately, my hometown, like many rural areas, is very anti-LGBTQ+. It especially makes me feel like the things I loved in childhood, like having farm animals and picking blackberries in the fields and getting lost in the woods, are cis and hetero-coded. Cottage core is an ideal where I can be visibly queer in rural spaces. Diversity has a more complicated place within the movement. As Beth Ann Kapoor points out, a video of white women draped in long cotton dresses and wandering romantically through fields connotes something else when your history is shaped by enslavement and exploitation. Miss Scarlett, where are you going without your shawl and not have fix to set in? And how come you didn't ask them gentlemen to stay for supper? You ain't got no more manners than a field hand. And writer Eunice Jean notes that frilly dresses and bright flowers are symbolic of an era built upon white supremacist ideology that glamorizes pastoral and settler living, i.e. a reminder of the antebellum South. The South sinking to its knees, it will never rise again. The cause. The cause of living in the past is dying right in front of us. Still, diverse voices are breaking through this inherent whiteness. Baking? I bake all the time! Reading? I'm an avid reader. Picnics? I do love a good picnic. Am I a cottage core girl? Influencer Nomi Siriu, who started at Cottage Core Black Folks, explains, The reason I wanted a vision board with black women living the cottage core aesthetic is that there's almost a message in seeing images of people who don't look like you, enjoying the life you want. And that message is, you don't belong here. Black content creators are carving out space in a place that's not usually reserved for them, and challenging the narrative of what black womanhood can be. Cannot this be a sort of 
reclamation of that, like reimagining a time where you would have previously been in suffering as just peaceful. At its best, cottagecore can be a safe space in which to express a marginalized identity away from what society thinks that identity should look like. On the other hand, cottagecore's semi-fictional performative nature risks reducing it to a passing entertainment trend that fades away as post-pandemic life gets back to normal. To disprove the accusations of frivolity, the cottagecore ethos has to prove that it's more than just diverting escape for individuals to temporarily forget their capitalist discontent. Cottagecore testifies to a deep desire to have a more direct connection between what we make and what we consume, to recover certain aspects of life that have been lost with all our progress and increased comforts. Maria, there is only one thing that can save us now. Classical, Classical French, French needlepoint. Needle in the wake of a globe-altering pandemic, Cottagecore's values do seem to have a greater chance of being incorporated into mainstream life. The exhaustion many of us have felt as our work and home lives have blurred raises questions about how we want to spend our time in a post-pandemic world. Would we all be happier and more productive if we had more time for ourselves? Have you always wanted to be a writer? Always, yes. It's a perfect job. Sitting, indoors, and always near a teapot. As Jenny O'Dell writes in How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy, to capitalist logic which thrives on myopia and dissatisfaction, there may indeed be something dangerous about something as pedestrian as doing nothing, escaping laterally toward each other. We might just find that everything we wanted is already here. You need to understand nature to appreciate the great, great things that have been created. We spend so much of our life walking around looking with never never, never see. More than ever, the urgent need to address climate change demands a widespread shift towards sustainability and a questioning of the growth-obsessed assumptions of our corporation-ruled society. Gather only the things we need. Emerson once wrote, Leave this military hurry and adopt the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. Cottagecore has adopted that mantra. Now, maybe it's time the rest of us followed suit. Take root in the ground, plant your seeds in the winter, and rejoice with the birds in the coming of spring. This is The Take on your favorite movie shows and culture. Thank you so much for watching and for supporting us. Please subscribe and never miss a take. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Inspired by today's video and my appreciation for nature, I'm checking out Kat Cocolette's class on how to paint botanical watercolors. I'm so excited about this class because it brings all the things I love about fresh flowers into an illustration that will never wilt. Kat's class walks you through everything you need to start painting with watercolors, from material recommendations to brush control and mixing color palettes. Right now, Skillshare is offering our viewers a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership, but that's only if you're one of the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below. So join today and jumpstart your creative journey for less than $10 a month with an annual subscription.